Welcome everybody <clears throat> to our next uh, session, the third panel on ongoing resilience of the European banking sector, more from a short-term perspective. Uh, and I would like to welcome um, Andrea and Ria, Chair of the Supervisory Board of the ECB. Uh, warm welcome. Uh, Anna Boutin, um, Chair of Banco Santander <coughs> in Madrid, um, and Gerhard Hoffmann, Board Member of the European Association of cooperative uh, banks. Warm welcome, um, and we are very happy that you are here and that we can meet in a, a virtual way. We have about a thousand senior bankers joining um, <clears throat> that um, video conference, um, and the intention is, of course, to encourage uh, the dialogue uh, between bankers, regulators, politicians on uh, where we stand in the crisis, how to move forward, and how to um, best emerge stronger from the crisis than we went into. Um, I would love to <clears throat> structure the discussion of the next uh, 25 minutes basically along um, three points. Um, what were the, the measures that um, you were taking and are they actually working? Um, second, what else uh, do we need um, uh, to uh, further address the issues <clears throat> that uh, have not been solved or will come up in 21. Um, and third, uh, what are the expectations um, from bankers to regulators, but also from uh, regulators to bankers to encourage uh, the dialogue? So let me start um, <clears throat> with um, you, Andrea and Ria, uh, and let me uh, ask you, how did it feel to be confronted with that unprecedented crisis um, and to sign in uh, the uh, different measures and relief packages um, that uh, you were taking as the ECB, and are you uh, happy so far with the progress and the impact? Well, good afternoon. It, it, it has been indeed a, a very daunting challenge. I mean, something that we have never seen before. Uh, but uh, I must say I'm very proud of uh, what we did uh, in in responding to the crisis, I think we were, were very fast off the blocks. Uh, we responded very, very fast. For the first time, we gave a totally unified uh, uh, response at the European level, something that would have been unthinkable before the uh, establishment of the of the banking union. And uh, let's say the the, uh, the first decisions were to uh, give supervisory relief banks to you know to accommodate. Uh, the, the, the crisis to avoid, uh, let's say, a, a credit crunch, to avoid the tightening of lending standards, to keep uh, credit flowing to households, uh, small businesses and corporates, and at the same time to give, uh, let's say, operational flexibility also to accommodate the shock of uh, uh, moving to uh, remote working in many, in many cases. And, and finally, also on the, on the other side, uh, to, uh, let's say, uh, to conserve capital, no? to avoid that uh, the relief in capital was accompanied by uh, capital flowing out of the system. So the, the rather controversial recommendation to banks uh, to refrain from distributions uh, of dividends and from buybacks. Uh, I think that overall, this package worked uh, pretty well. Uh, if we compare the way in which... Uh, Let's say the uh, uh, the uh, immediate uh, uh, response to the, to the crisis was from the banking sector. You see that uh, there was only a very limited uh, tightening of lending standards. While in 2009, after Lehman, of course, there was a massive tightening of of credit standards, and also uh, there was uh, we we there is empirical evidence, market-based evidence that shows that uh, the um, uh, the uh, combined effect of monetary policy and supervisory measures uh, managed to avoid uh, the uh, uh, bank sovereign loop uh, type of uh, dynamics that was so uh, damaging in the last uh, in the last crisis. I think that uh, from that point of view, let's say the uh, the first uh, phase uh, was uh, was uh, uh, a success. Uh, of course, this doesn't mean that we have addressed all the issues. There will be much more uh, to come. Uh, we have made, uh, during the summer, we published uh, 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 the results of our own vulnerability assessment, and we showed that, uh, basically, the banking sector is uh, entered this crisis more resilient, able to uh, 
withstand also a, a very sharp uh, recession as the one that we have uh, seen so far. Uh, but it also highlighted that uh, there could be, in, a, in, in tail events, there could be uh, material risks uh, in terms of uh, impact on the bank's capital uh, and also in terms of deterioration of asset quality. Uh, we, we, we simulated also a severe scenario, and in that scenario we showed that uh, there could be uh, up to 5.7% uh, declining the common equity tier one ratios and uh, up to 1.4 trillion stock of NPLs building again in the European banking sector. So we need to be, again, so far quite uh, uh, with the way in which uh, it went, but also prepare for what, uh, for what comes next. Understood. So picking up on your last point, uh, what has been discussed here in the previous session quite a lot is the pro potential pro cyclicality of uh, regulation. Yeah. So one could argue, when we enter 2021, uh, the worst is still to come, since uh, we will see the balance sheets of the companies um, with all the effect and the impact uh, COVID has, and then of course uh, it will uh, translate into the ratings, into increased RWAs, and potentially um, a limited lending capacity. Um, <clears throat> would you agree, and how do you see uh, towards 2021 the measures that we still need to take for preventing that this economic crisis turns into a banking crisis? This is for me, right? Yes, for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I think that uh, um, looking ahead... I think that, first of all, I think that we have shown that the current regulatory framework that was set up after the last crisis is much less procyclical than in the past. So we have tools that enable us to, you know, uh, to um, uh, use buffers in, in times of stress and uh, rebuild them gradually after the stress has, uh, has disappeared. And that is what we, we we tried and we are trying still to uh, to manage. So that's uh, an important element. The fact that supervisors now have also a broader look to financial stability effects and implications of their of their uh, actions. Uh, in looking ahead, I think that there are two main areas on which I think that uh, we should focus our attention. Um, uh, the first one is uh, is. Uh, that we should, uh, I mean, the phase in which we are in right now is to uh, brace for the impact. So basically, uh, the uh, so far, we don't have a clear materialization of the deterioration of asset quality in the bank's balance sheet. And uh, uh, we know that, uh, especially when the moratoria will start being lifted, uh, we will see more effect. And some actually, some moratoria are expiring today in some countries, and then we will have uh, many coming to an end in the coming uh, months. So uh, on, uh, from this point of view, I think that uh, we need to encourage the banks uh, to prepare for this, uh, for this, uh, for this impact. Uh, to, uh, we already sent a letter to the CEOs in July saying that uh, they need to you know, make sure that they have the operational capability to deal with this uh, likely increase in non-performing loans. And also now is the time to start uh, being very active in the early identification of arrears, case-by-case uh, uh, case reclassification, prudent provisioning choices, and uh, uh, especially have uh, borrower-specific restructuring and forbearance uh, uh, actions that, uh, uh, that enable to single out uh, distressed but viable customers from those which actually uh, uh, are not viable and need to be actually uh, put into uh, into uh, into a different bucket. Uh, so uh, the active management of NPLs, in my view, and the preparation and the discrimination, the identification of problems are the most important uh, thing right now. The more these actions are delayed, the more likely the problem will be difficult to manage uh, afterwards. Uh, we do have new policies that have been developed by the ECB, but also in the legislation to deal with the uh, with the uh, uh, non-performing loans, and uh, I think that uh, let's say in the in the past crisis, we have been uh, slower, I would say, that other than other jurisdictions in dealing with uh, with uh, the, the, the the deterioration of asset quality, with the legacy of non-performing assets, 
it's important that this time we are very proactive, we move fast and we manage to clean the balance sheets of the banks uh, uh, fast enough. And I also uh, welcome the the remarks by uh, the Commission, by Vice President Dombrovskis a few days ago, saying that uh, also from the policy side there needs to be effort to accompany this process with uh, uh, measures to uh, uh, facilitate uh, uh, the, the working of the secondary market for NPLs, securitization, and also a, a common framework for national asset management companies. The second point is that, of course, the, the banking sector entered this crisis in a condition of structural weakness, uh, very low profitability, uh, driven by excess capacity, uh, problems of, in terms of cost efficiency, and uh, uh, which have driven the, the bank valuation to historic lows. Um, so it is uh, important that uh, we uh, manage to take the opportunity to some extent of this crisis uh, to uh, address these structural issues in an effective, uh, in an effective uh, way. And uh, uh, um, there are different uh, tools, uh, of course. Uh, we know that uh, you have discussed already in the afternoon digitalization. Uh, we know that uh, the lessons from these, uh, uh, let's say, lockdowns uh, and uh, have thought has uh, brought many banks to reconsider their a branch uh, network uh, and their, let's say, choices in terms of distribution. Uh, there is also, let's say, there are broader uh, uh, thinking that we need to make on the new normal. Uh, we also argue that to reduce uh, excess capacity consolidation could be an important, uh, an important tool, and uh, we have tried to, on our side, support the process by giving clarity as to the... Um, uh, supervisory policy that would be applied in that direction. So I think these two are now the main challenges. So bracing for the impact and being fast, uh, prepared and dealing fast with the uh, asset quality problems that will materialize and dealing with the structural inefficiencies that we still have in the sector and, and get out of the, of the crisis stronger than we enter into it. So question to uh, Anna Boutin then. Um, People argue um, <clears throat> that banks so far uh, have been part of the solution um, of that crisis and not part of the problem, um, uh, maybe as 2000, in 2008. So what are your views on that? <clears throat> How did it actually work um, to stay operational, be resilient uh, in the last uh, six, seven months? And what are your expectations uh, to regulators um, to continue to be part of uh, the solution. Thank you very much, and um, it's great to uh, be here with you and uh, with Mr. Andrea and others in, in, this, in this conference. Um, so I'd say in order to answer the question, I think the, the, the broader title of the panel, are we as a banking sector resilient in the context of the crisis? And I'd say that the answer to that question is both yes and no. I'd say yes, because the stock of capital and liquidity are very strong. And I think uh, Chairman Enria explained it very well. However, it's also true that the answer to that question would be no, because the flow of capital or the capacity from the banking sector to attract investment is quite weak. So, you know, the context of how we got here, it's it's very clear that the emphasis from the sector regulators and uh, not just in Europe, throughout the world, has been to increase the stock of capital. Just as, a, as an indication, since 2008 uh, until June 2020, the top 20 European banks uh, have increased capital by two with risk-weighted assets remaining flat. So basically, this has resulted in doubling the capital ratios. However, one of the unintended consequences has been that the value of banks, and especially European banks, uh, as we compare with American banks, has been greatly reduced. So I'd like also to make uh, a second important here, which is that resilience over time to adverse cycles and the ability of banks to support the economy also depends on the business model at the end on the flow on the pre-provisioned profit. Um, again, as an indication, uh, Santander until June, we, after growing the top line by 20% the last few years, we were in constant euros, we, we had exactly the same level as, as last time. 
And this is a very important uh, variable that shows uh, the business model. So the second one is, of course, um, as I was saying, that there's a combination of factors that means that uh, banks, and especially European banks' capacity to generate capital of flow is not where we would like it to be. Some of it is, of course, structural, the low interest rates. Um, and again, as an indication, if in 2008, 25% of the net interest income in the Eurozone corresponded to deposit spread, in 2020, income from deposits, I'd say, is a best zero, maybe negative in some cases. Uh, there is, of course, regulation, uh, transfer prices in Europe, overdrafts. In many cases, a very different scenario for European banks, for American banks. A very simple example is interchange fees on, on cards in the U.S. They're very different from where they are in Europe. Uh, Minister Scholz uh, mentioned new market participants. We are a huge believer, and I welcome comments uh, from the European Commission on same activities, same regulation, on data, on payments, but that has also been a factor. Um, and of course, in many cases, higher tax pressure. So, is the sector resilient? Absolutely, yes, in terms of the stock, but not as much as we would like in terms of the capacity to attract capital. So what is it we can do? What is it we can do to improve the flow of capital and attract investment? At the end, we do need capital in the banking sector. Um, and of course, uh, that's related to our valuations. Uh, I'd say, first of all, is we should stop discriminating. And this is the case in, in, in different countries where banks get higher tax rates than other corporates. Uh, contributions to resolution funds and deposit guarantee schemes in different countries I think price interventions are not warranted given the very high competition we have now in the sector. Uh, in many cases, prices are lower than in the capital markets. An example is restrictions in transfer price and payments. In some countries, Poland and France, for example, have interest rate caps on loans, cross-selling limitations. Third idea would be to, con and this is being done, and I welcome very much what has been done temporarily uh, because of COVID, but I think we should continually uh, review uh, regulation to see if there are items that generate costs that are not strictly necessary. Um, and finally, of course, and this brings me to the dividends, uh, we have different opinions here, but uh, my view, and I think my colleagues share this, is that a reconsideration of the recommendation we had earlier this year, because it's basically implied subordinating back to the rest of the economy. So obviously we're a special type of company, but no, no dividends are paid to our shareholders, but we're supporting other companies that are allowed to pay dividends. By the way, in many cases, even utilities, like in the case of Spain, electrical utilities and others. So, again, this raises the relative cost of capital. So, uh, this would be this would be my view on on your question. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, one additional question, uh, since you briefly touched it, <clears throat> is uh, of course on digitalization, since we discussed it also earlier in the afternoon uh, extensively. What is your view um, <clears throat> on the operating model um, of banks now that uh, these beautiful video conferences are all working and it looks like we can even um, originate loans in a digital way? Do you see <clears throat> this crisis turned into opportunity accelerating digitalization? Some people say uh, by five to ten years what we were expecting before the crisis. Uh, absolutely. I think... Uh just a brief comment, because even though you didn't ask me, uh, on consolidation across Europe, and, and we're hearing lots of recommendations on we should do more efficiencies, um, and of course, going more digital. Um, again, I don't want to bore you with numbers, but since 2008, European banks have decreased costs by 20% and the number of branches by 30. So we are going digital, we are reducing costs, and of course, we all understand we need to do more of this. But I think uh, Minister Schultz said it really well. Uh, we need an integrated European market. One of the advantages Americans and Chinese, they deal in a single market and we don't. Uh, and of course, again, uh, he said it very well, but we need banking union, we need European deposit insurance scheme, 
We need rules. Again, he mentioned insolvency, very important, insolvency laws, legal aspects. Uh, and we need barriers to cross-border integration to be, to be reviewed. So, so I think all of this would help digital, would help consumers, and would help European banks to get uh, to the place where we should be. If, if you just allow me one, one, one last comment, um, sure. I, I want to say that I think Europe has responded, yeah, Europe has responded incredibly well and in a very unified way on the economic side. Um, I think if there's one thing we need to really focus on is the health response and many countries, including some like my own Spain, uh, you know, we would really welcome a holistic framework coming from the European Union on what are the 10 steps that we need to take with more or less intensity, depending on where we are on the health metrics, to learn how to live with the virus. It's about travel, it's about quarantine, it's about test, because every day we don't do this, it's going to be increasing cost to the economy, to jobs, and of course to lives. So I just wanted to end with that one. Thank you. Sure, yeah, and I very much agree with um, that we have to live with the virus and find guidelines so that the individuals and corporates can take their own decisions. Um, that is usually not something the state can do in a better way. At least I would comment uh, coming from East Germany and having 30 years of unification now, um, I can uh, assure that this is not working very well in the long term. Um, and I also agree on consolidation. Uh, it looks like we learned our lesson well from 2008, uh, where the US banking sector was recapitalized much faster. NPLs were written off much faster. Um, but we still need uh, a consolidated or one market uh, from a simple size and scale perspective. And we also need, um, uh, for sure, consolidation going in some way. Otherwise, it's hard to scale and be profitable in the long term if we compare um, with US banks or Chinese banks, uh, plus everything you said on the capital market and banking unit integration. So let me turn to um, <coughs> uh, Mr. Hoffman. Um, uh, I know that uh, uh, issues that are very close to your heart uh, have been discussed already um, in terms of procyclical uh, uh, measures and, and all, how long uh, actually relief measures will be in place um, if needed. Um, <clears throat> if I could uh, briefly touch with you on the topic of um, uh, ESG uh, in terms of is there a chance to actually combine uh, what we do um, in terms of support mechanism for the banks also with the ESG, especially the environment side uh, that uh, kept us busy uh, until beginning of March. Um, uh, and uh, ob obviously that issue will come back. Um, <clears throat> what is your view um, on, on that issue? Can we combine it um, with all the efforts we are taking to uh, bring uh, back the economy and uh, keep a strong banking sector? Yeah, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for this question. I would broaden uh, the question a little bit and include both the Capital Markets Union and the ESG issues, because uh, to some extent uh, they could be covered uh, in, in one answer. Uh, I believe uh, uh, that the, uh, the European agenda on ESG, on sustainability, requires hundreds of billions of investment. And uh, this again has to do with the banking sector. As long as we do not have a, a capital markets union, it will be mainly the banking sector to produce these kinds of funds and to, to provide these kinds of funds. So it's important that, uh, that the regulation for the banking sector is in a way right and not overdone. And I would like to echo uh, Anna Botin's point here uh, that really uh, we should not waste any crisis, we should not waste this crisis, but uh, ask uh, what can be done to make the system more efficient, uh, more resilient, and also more capable of doing its work. And uh, it, it starts with some administrative burden with how can we reduce bureaucracy on the corporate sector, but also in the financial sector. And I think this question should be asked uh, during this crisis or as, as a consequence of this crisis. This would be one, one of the main points. And then uh, there is this, this issue, you rightly mentioned it, of pro-cyclicality. 
there I have a slight disagreement uh, with Andrea and Ria. I, I like everybody, every everything he said, but I think on the um, procyclicality, we have actually more procyclicality in the system than we had before, uh, especially because. Uh, we have this IFRS 9 effect, which is a huge effect on banks, and we have uh, the um, the uh, NPL backstop. These are just two two important examples in this regard. But uh, a third aspect uh, on coming back uh, to this combined issue of ESG versus capital markets union, I think we are taking too much of a regulatory approach and too little on a, an approach of uh, market incentives or using the market actually to achieve these goals. Can you really achieve a capital markets union and huge billions of hun hundreds of billions of ESG investments by just regulating? I'm, I don't think so. We need uh, market-driven incentives to, uh, so to speak, bring this, these two projects forward. And here I have uh, <clears throat> some hope. Uh, uh, Minister Scholz mentioned that um, the European Union is, uh, so to speak, uh, starting this European reconstruction program, this reconstruction plan of 750 billion. And I believe, I strongly believe, that this program of the European Union, which he's rightly saying that creates for the first time sizable resources within the uh, European Union, uh, his Hamiltonian moment, as he called it, um, that we use these funds and uh, the mechanisms uh, to support both capital markets union and to support uh, the sustainability, a sustainable economy. Uh, this would be key, not just use it for obvious purposes, just to support economies, but also to create a better future in these two areas, at least. And I think uh, there's a great uh, responsibility also for governments and uh, for uh, the um, uh, for, for the European Union to use these funds very wisely, because uh, it doesn't seem that we have a, a lot of a second chance here. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Gerd, and uh, to everybody. Um, I appreciate very much the discussion and. Um, Again, thank you uh, from Frankfurt. Uh, hope to see you soon.